Here at First Lutheran Church in Windsor, Ontario, we have last Sunday celebrated with a great deal of joy the Easter festival, rejoicing in the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But there were, no doubt, millions of other people around us, perhaps even here in the city, who did not celebrate Easter because they have a problem with the resurrection, with somebody coming back from the dead. Today we're going to hear from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians where he deals with just that problem. What if he didn't? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On the first Sunday after the Easter festival, we hear the epistle from the first letter of St. John in chapter 5. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has borne concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. This is the epistle of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And the Holy Gospel, according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked when the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to Jesus. Amen. Let us confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, 
Very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hear the word of God recorded in the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians in chapter 15. Now if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of God. Sisters and brothers in Christ, only a few decades had passed after that first of all the Easter days when the Apostle Paul sent this letter to the Christian congregation in the city of Corinth. And instead of rejoicing at this wonderful festival day and the great event it commemorates, instead of encouraging his readers and listeners to faith in Christ and to joy in the resurrection from the dead, St. Paul spends an entire chapter of this letter, not on fact, but on fiction. He deals not with the reality of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, but he argues about something that didn't happen. Apparently, there were people in the congregation at Corinth who found it difficult to believe something like the dead being raised to life again. You must be kidding, they thought. There is no such thing, they were convinced. And Paul is always the pastor, that is, shepherd of his flock. He takes people seriously in what they are and certainly in what they believe or don't believe. There is no such thing as a resurrection. Once you're dead, you're dead. Dead like a doornail. Over, out, finished. Now that sounds like something of the 21st century, doesn't it? That sounds like something that any modern person here in Canada would say and be convinced of. Dead is dead. Anyone who reads carefully the text we just heard must have noticed that the Apostle Paul uses one word, one tiny little word repeatedly. Did you notice? At least seven times we heard the word if. If there is no resurrection. If Christ has not been raised. If we have hope only for this life. Small word, big meaning. Friends, I would like to do today what Paul did back then. Like the Corinthians, let's ask this question in the first part of the sermon. What if Christ did not rise from the dead? St. Paul writes, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain. Indeed, then there would be no preaching, there would be no worship service, we wouldn't record this service here in our church, I wouldn't be standing here, and you probably wouldn't bother listening to this recording. If the story of Christ would have ended on Good Friday, 
then the apostle would have returned to their former jobs and professions. Peter would have gone back to be a fisherman. Matthew would have continued collecting money at the customs office. And all of them would have been terribly disappointed. Even if some of the disciples would have written down the words of Jesus and his deeds and perhaps proclaimed a new religion, their proclamation and witness would have been, as St. Paul says, in vain. Or as the original text says, it would have been absolutely empty. If Christ were not risen from the dead, then preaching about him and his cross would be like trying to harvest corn from empty straw, like handing an empty cup to a thirsty man, like offering an empty purse to a woman in poverty, or like giving empty medicine bottles to the sick. If Christ would not, not have been raised from the dead, then all Christian proclamation would be nothing but empty talk. Indeed, all preachers would be false witnesses, and all believers would be silly fools. Their faith would be nothing but a personal whim, kind of like a phantom. If the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, ended, by simply recording the death of Jesus, then they would be nothing more than the biography of either a marvelous idealist or of a clever swindler. Why would we need that today? Just to hear that 2,000 years ago Jesus healed the sick? There are thousands, millions of people who are concerned about their sickness today. Or to hear that Jesus led a holy life, that he died on the cross, that he said of himself, I am the Son of God, the Savior of mankind. Well, if he didn't rise from the dead, if he's but another corpse in a grave today, then he was but another of the many deceivers and swindlers and impostors that the world has known throughout history. And that would not be so bad if it didn't mean we have no one who saved us. No Easter, no savior. That's the equation. Did we not learn from the Old Testament that the Messiah, God's son, would bear our sin, our punishment, the fiery wrath of God, so that we, you and I, would be free from sin, from punishment, and God's wrath. All you have to do is read Isaiah chapter 53. Now, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, then he would not be the promised Savior, and we would still be in our sin, subject to its dominion and under God's wrath. Forget the church, indeed forget the Christian faith, that would be nothing but a sham. And by the way, if Christ is dead, then his word spoken on the night in which he was betrayed, this is my body, my blood, given for you for the forgiveness of sins, that would simply be untrue. His blood would be no better than that of any other person who was tortured and then died. So just forget about Holy Communion. And while you're at it, forget about baptism. That's just water. Forget about the absolution, the forgiveness of your sins. That's just the pastor's empty talk. Forget about prayer in general. Forget in particular about praying, forgive us our sins. If Christ did not rise, then all those unknown thousands who believed in Jesus in the hour of their death were caught up in a terrible mistake when they expected that he, Christ, would represent them before the judgment seat of the Heavenly Father. It would be just a terrible mistake. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, St. Paul writes. 
If Christ was not raised from the dead, then Christians too, like the rest of mankind, we would be eternally damned. But we would also be tragically misled already here in life on this earth then they would be better off who say, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. If, if Christ was not raised. What a terrible thought. No consolation for those in mourning, no hope for the dying. Everything would be meaningless. Is there no resurrection? Well, if. Three times we see that, beloved in Christ, it's such a terrible thought. I think I better pass on to part two of the sermon. No more ifs. St. Paul rings out aloud a shout of joy that begins with, but, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The apostle has led us to the brink of hell and now he leads us to the height of hope and glory. The resurrection of Jesus Christ on that first Easter morning has been proclaimed by many reliable witnesses. It is a well-founded historical fact. At the beginning of chapter 15, St. Paul recalls what had happened. Let me quote, I delivered to you what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive. How easy it would have been for Paul's listeners or readers to try to check up on the truth of what he was saying. Just ask them, he said. The witnesses are still around. The resurrection of Christ from the dead is not some ideology that the original disciples spread around because they had become optimists suddenly. On the contrary, the disciples had run away from the cross. They were afraid. They neither expected Christ to be alive again, nor did they believe it when the women at the grave reported to them the angel's message. He is not here, he's risen. And the risen Lord spent a great deal of time and effort, indeed 40 long days after Easter, to persuade his disciples that he was again amongst them. He explained to the disciples on the way to Emmaus but why this all had to happen. He broke the bread with them. He showed them the wounds on his body. He eats with them on the shore of Lake Galilee. No more ifs. But in fact, Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Did you hear this like a trumpet blast? That means everything is different from what we spoke about in the first part. Everything is changed now by the reality of Christ's resurrection. Faith, your faith, is not now vain or empty, but it stands on a firm foundation with a marvelous content. Now our preaching is not vain or empty, but it is divine truth and a source of spiritual strength. Now the church's proclamation of Christ's gospel is bread for the soul that stills our spiritual hunger. It is water that quenches our inmost thirst. It is medicine to heal the wounded conscience. Because Christ is truly risen, we are no longer the slaves of sin and guilt. They are forgiven in his precious blood. God the Father has accepted his son's sacrifice in our behalf, and now we dare approach him without fear. 
And because Christ is truly risen, my friends, all those who died in faith are not lost or forever gone. They are saved to be with their Lord in eternal joy and favor. Now the crosses on the graves of Christians are not signs of hopelessness, but of certain victory. And don't forget, you too can be in on this. Christ's resurrection has something in store for every one of us. Perhaps you remember, Paul had written, Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Well, first fruits were the initial products of the harvest. They were offered as a sacrifice to God. Christ being the first fruit means that others will follow. Will you be among them? Witnessing to Christ's resurrection, confessing that he is our living Lord, believing in his grace and mercy, using his holy sacraments for the strengthening of our faith that enables each and every one of us to rejoice in the power of the risen Lord. My friends, no more ifs. Rather, let us tell the world, Christ is risen, alleluia. He is risen indeed, alleluia. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, your Son is the firstborn from the dead. In him we have been reborn into a new and living hope. Nurture us with the pure milk of your word, that we may grow to maturity of faith and have everlasting life. You have promised to overcome our doubts by the patience and grace of your Son. Inspire us by the testimony of his holy apostles and build up your church in our time. Remove the weight of sin from as many as will repent. Almighty God, build up the households of your people that your holy children begotten in baptism may grow in your grace and share together in your forgiveness and life. The faith of your people shall overcome the world. Let it be so. By the testimony of the word and sacrament, overcome the powers of this world. Turn its evil to good and enliven many to follow Christ in faith. O God of all comfort, you permit even your beloved people to fall into difficult days of confusion and suffering and sometimes draw near to death. Send your spirit to lift them up in faith, especially do we call upon you for the people of war-torn Ukraine, that they may continue to follow you through their trials into eternal life. Merciful Lord, as your Son made the disciples glad in his rising and life-giving flesh on the first day of the week, and again eight days later, so let us find gladness in his wounds and in his abiding presence among us each week as we worship you in church. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to join in the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>